Welcome to this episode of The Agronomists. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. Uh, we're in for a good one, folks. We've got three guests, count them one, two, three, for this evening. Um, so this is going to be a lot of fun, I think. Or it's going to be way too much for my bandwidth, and it's just going to freeze. And it's going to be also a lot of fun. All right. Uh, hey, thanks to everybody jumping on super early. Love to see everyone here. Hi, Brent. Hi, Warren. Hi, Kevin. Uh, na, yo, Jason. I love it. Oh, boy, yo. Uh, we, Pete's here. Ray, this is pretty fantastic. Sorry about uh, your weather there, Kevin. Wet and windy sounds awful. Uh, we started lambing this weekend. I know everyone wants to know about sheep. Anyway, and it was beautiful and it's lovely and it can continue. And Kara Booster Juice is here too. All right. Sorry, Ooster House. I'm not good with Dutch names. Um, which in a moment you'll see is going to be a problem. Okay. Before we get started tonight, of course, uh, CU credits just by following along. You can qualify, but you do have to let us know that you did watch the broadcast. So head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist. It's tomorrow morning and you can sign up for those CEU credits. Quick note, next week we do not have a show. So the Real Agriculture team is converging on Lethbridge next week uh, for three or four days of strategic planning meetings. We have not done this in three years. No word of a lie. Um, and so we are all getting together. So we are taking next Monday off because we will be busy brainstorming, which is a fancy word for axe throwing and merriment. Okay. Um, and no, Peter, not lots of triplets yet. Um, also, we have grassy sheep. They don't throw a lot of triplets. And that's good because sheep only have two teats. Okay. Um, but this is not a livestock class. No, no. This is all about agronomy and specifically wire room tonight. One more thing. We do have to send a shout out to our show sponsor. So that our sponsors, sorry, Adama Canada, Real Egg Radio and Mind Your Farm Business. And for Adama Canada, while other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver, leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today or visit adama.com. Com. And of course, Real Ag Radio goes Monday to Friday on Rural Radio Channel 147. Kara Oosterhouse uh, hosted today, so go check out that show. Uh, you can see all, or sorry, listen to all the back episodes of the show at realagriculture.com slash radio. Um, okay, without further ado, nobody needs to hear me chat. It is time for our guests. Yes, we are talking wireworm. And so... The three guests everyone has been waiting for. We have up very late Ryan Barrett with the PEI Potato Board. We've got Dennis Van Dyke of Omafra who did not send me pictures of ugly carrots. And we have Shad Milligan of Syngenta Canada who tends to hang out in the Lethbridge, Calgary area. Welcome here, gents. Good evening. Glad to be here. Thanks for having us. All righty. Okay. So, Ryan, we'll start yes. with you. So we'll start east, we'll work our way west. How are things 
on the island? Uh, snowy today. <laughs> mm. Had some uh, unexpected uh, flurries and snow today. So, I mean, work work was finished early in uh, Charlottetown. So, anyway, but uh, we're, we got a lot of growers getting geared up for uh, the growing season. And, uh, of course, we got some good news there on Friday about the border finally opening. So, uh, PEI potatoes mm -hmm. can start flowing south. So, that's the best news. That is very good news. And am I wrong or did you need the moisture? But would you prefer it not in the slow release? Would you prefer it in the immediate <laughs> release form? Well, in PEI, it's kind of different than it is out west where we usually get a lot of rain in the spring and a lot of rain in the fall. And I would say that our aquifers are fully recharged already and our uh, fields are fully saturated. So we're probably at the, I think everybody here is at the, we don't really need any more snow face. <laughs> okay. I think there are probably some people in Manitoba that would agree with you at this point. Uh, Dennis, we'll move to you here in Ontario. Where Whereabouts are you at and what are things like in your neck of the woods? I'm out of Guelph. Um, still fairly cold, cold, waiting for a real spring to come. Uh, we had a bit of a warm stretch, so a little bit of field work got done last week, week and a half ago. But uh, I cooled off again, so can't wait for it to warm up. Mm -hmm. um, so Brent, who was the first person on in to say hello, he beat John to the punch, uh, says send some to Colorado. So if we can send moisture to Colorado, actually, I hate to break it to you, Brent, but I'm pretty sure we get your moisture most of the time. It's called the Colorado Low. It comes up that way. Anyway, okay, we'll work on that. All right, and Shad, I heard Lethbridge has been cool and warm and lots of moisture. No false how are no, things false. There? i would i would say officially that the the planting season has begun in southern alberta we've got some growers that have started to head into the fields and start to get some early planting done uh but like anything the further north you you do move uh it it peters out pretty quickly because we still have to ryan's point we still have some weather conditions are up there but uh you talk to most people i would say within a week to 10 days uh i would say most of that southern alberta uh, stretch, which is, I would say, Highway 1 South will be going um, uh, full bore on seating. So I j would just like to point out to everybody that that seems wrong because Ontario is not anywhere near. <laughs> and yet, Alberta, here we go. No, but but Chad, let's walk through that a little bit. It's because there's no moisture, right? I mean, it's dry. It's dry. We'll have uh, definitely that subsoil moisture is not there. Um, we do have some of that that moisture that you're sh you're trying to seed into to get that germination to happen but uh realistically in some areas it's uh unless we get a couple of uh weather events where it's going to be just a, it's going to be a rain by rain basis for some of the, the crops to grow again this year mm -hmm. absolutely all right pete says it's not early in alberta anymore all the wheat should be planted in march yes you and brian barris can have your early ultra early wheat team and rah rah. Okay. All right. But tonight we are talking wireworm. And this one, this is an interesting one for a couple of reasons. Um, I I love insect pests. I think they're absolutely fascinating, but we also love to hate them in that this one, of course, in particular is a really tough one. So um, I want to delve into, into sort of what we're dealing with um, and sort of set the scene for us. Now, we do have a clip uh, from Haley Catton uh, out of AAFC that we'll go to in just a moment. Um, but we we definitely, as you've noticed, we've got some some serious potato representation here. And so, Ryan, I'll start with you on this one. Why is wireworm such an important pest of the potato crop? So... Um... We did a little bit of uh, math back in 2016 because we were trying to really understand how much of a problem wireworm was for us. And I would say that that was probably at about the height of the damage or in the height of the problem that we had. And at that time, we estimated that wireworm damage plus mitigation costs cost our industry about $10 million a year. So, uh, and about, it's about half damage, half $5 million damage, $5 million mitigation. So, um, it, uh, makes tubers unmarketable. Uh, so particularly for the folks that are in the fresh market industry and seed industry, that's really a big problem. Um, even on processing potatoes, you know, if they get more than about five or 10%, uh, wireworm damage on an individual tuber, they throw it in the in the bat in the in the call bin so it can really do a number on potatoes and um particularly in potatoes uh 
the wireworms become most active in September in Prince Edward Island uh, when there is adequate soil moisture and they're coming up to the surface to feed. And that's when the potatoes are, you know, we're getting close to harvest. And so you can go from having a nice, clean, beautiful crop of potatoes that aren't quite ready to harvest. And then two weeks later, you just go in to dig and you got wireworm holes all over them. So um, it can be a nasty business in a short period of time. Um, and the biggest thing is that wireworm are, for a long time, we didn't have a lot of products that actually killed them. We just had products and that maybe slowed them down a bit. We have European wireworms here in PEI, which are really uh, aggressive and the neonics don't work on them. Uh, so we need to uh, we need to have other tools. So we've been doing lots of research on them, trying to figure out what we can do. And those European wireworms have about a four to five year life cycle here. So, um, you know, just be, you know, if you have a year where a whole bunch of eggs get laid, you may not see the, you know, the rewards of that or the, or the, the impact of that for about four to five years. Wow. Okay. And now, and it is one of these pests and, and we are going to delve into that tonight a little bit uh, because of that sort of very long life cycle or the, the sort of the persistence of it in the soil is really one of the key issues with it. Now, Dennis, you work in, uh, in on the hort side, uh, but with, you know, root vegetables, so potatoes, but also some other crops. So how big of an issue um, in, for your sector is wireworm? It's definitely an issue. Uh, it's, I would say, sporadic. I don't think we have as, as high of a pressure as they do out east. Uh, just in terms of numbers but uh as, you know in our t potato ground we have a lot of production on sandy soil which they love uh we have pretty tight rotations which doesn't help with the long life cycle and we have a lot of rotations with small grains and other cereals in the potato rotation which you know also they love so um the fields that have them it's a big problem it's not uh, uh not in every field but it's definitely um sporadic um in the other vegetable crops I work with, um, similar issue. Uh, you know, at least in potato, we have a little bit of products that work or will stun them or knock them back a little bit. In the other vegetables, we just don't have anything labeled. So we're trying to manage them outside of that rotation, and it can be difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Warren Schneckenberg asks, are neonics still allowed in potato production on label in Ontario? Yes, on potatoes, we have a high rate of uh, Titan or um uh yes uh, as a seed treatment we can okay. use it so we have uh restrictions around field crop use as a seed treatment in ontario but that does not extend mm -hmm. to potatoes so yeah, okay we still have that now shad moving further west um and away from now don't i know there are potatoes in alberta there are also sugar beets, but of course we talk, usually in the West, we talk far more on the cereal side. So how big of a concern are wireworm for the cereal side? Yeah, great. I, I, and it, I would do it just if I don't mention Manitoba and about their potato production as well, just to I shout have out the Manitoba yeah. weather. So one or two. Uh, but yeah, for all intents and purposes, yeah, cereals are uh, one of those things where they're, uh, the wireworms uh, tend to gravitate towards that as a food source. And it's, it's, you know, I, I would say in the past 10 years, it's one of those things that, you know, it's been wrecking havoc for growers trying to make these decisions on what to do and sharing back to, to Ryan's point. There's, there's just some things coming into the marketplace now that are doing a mortality side of things, but it, it really is the management side of this as, uh, as well too, on the cereal side of things. It's hard as a grower to, okay, do I have wire worms? What's my population? So a lot of this comes back to a little bit of, of, of scouting uh, as well and determining, okay, how bad is my wire worm conditions? What were the years previous when I grew a cereal crop here? Am I going to get burnt if I go back to cereal and cereal? So yeah, I mean, uh, the wire worm themselves, if you look at what they really like to eat, it's interesting because they'll gravitate towards corn right away. Uh, I've seen cornfields in Southern Alberta that are, that are, they'll go to the seed first as well has moved down to really barley, wheat, things like that. But all, when you look at it too, is really how do they find that food source? And it's that seed, that seed, that, that seed shoots its root out, it shoots or germinates, it's releasing CO2. And that's the re real reason why that wireworm is attracted to that. So something like corn has a big seed and, you know, release a little bit more CO2 than other crops. So we'll, and then it becomes that smorgasbord for them to move down the row uh, as that. And Ryan had a good point too, is that you've got different 
life cycles of wireworms through that field. Mm -hmm. So you may have some that have just, you know, come out of the, the hatch, or you may have one coming into full completion as an adult, or you have some in the middle. So the variation in that field, as long as the long life cycle tends to be, you could be coming back into a cereal crop three years later and still have to deal with wireworms as well. So, yeah. Okay, and we'll, we'll cover that in a second. I just want to quickly touch on this uh, because, Ryan, you did mention the European wireworm. Um, so Peter and Jason both are asking, so Dennis, do you know what species Ontario, if Ontario is dealing with that yet? And Shad, do we know if Western Canada is dealing with any of that yet? So Dennis, any ideas? Uh, yeah, don't we do not have the European ones, uh, luckily. Uh, I think Jocelyn Smith, uh, Dr. Art Shasma, and um, Tracy Batty do... Um, Pretty good surveys on that side so we yeah. don't we don't have the european one just uh yeah pneumonias mostly okay. and uh some hypnoidus but no okay so ryan keep it there shad um what do we have yes. what do we know about the species out in western canada lindsay this could be probably a perfect time to bring up uh some of those maps that uh i provided i love and maps so uh this is done by Agriculture Canada and with Syngenta as well, but really this is for all intents and purposes of some of the, the species mostly, mostly found through Western Canada, um, where uh, looking at this one is bicolor. Uh, if you want to go, there's the three other ones, uh, Mr. Producer Jason, we have that we'll talk to, but you've got Destructor, Bicolor, Californias, uh, and Hypnotes as well, it would be the th three main species that you'd find. The one interesting that uh, f thing that I've seen over the years on this is that there is an actual species that really prefer irrigated land. And mm -hmm. we can, what we've done in some of these, and I believe it's by caller, I think uh, producer Jason. There we go. Yeah. Um, I think it's the third one that's, or California might be the one that actual, for a long story short, it's that what we've seen is that there is a species of wireworms. Here we go. They're California seem to prefer and if you look at this particularly where that box is uh that's southern alberta that's where a large uh, extent of the irrigation is found and if you look out to outlook saskatchewan that's another spot where there's quite a bit of irrigation as well and we tended to see on these surveys uh they pop up so that was interesting to see a, a, a certain species of wireworms uh kind of liking more of that wet soil uh, versus something like the destructor which is the bigger wireworm and really is found out through all dry land acres, what we've seen uh, through the three prairie provinces. And um, I can also, uh, yeah, go ahead. sorry, I was just gonna add that, um, so there's three European species. Uh, we see them in PEI, uh, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Um, and uh, the worst of those being Agriotis sputatter, but they do have Agriotis uh, lineatus and obscurus in lower mainland BC and in Vancouver Island. Um, so they do have those aggressive uh, uh, European species in British Columbia. Interesting. So interesting. Okay. Interesting side side note on that is yeah. that actually working with um, Haney Farms years ago, they would ship treated seed to Victoria barley with an insecticide to protect the barley crops for uh, a horse a horse guy out there because he could not grow a cereal crop out in Victoria without it. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. And so I wonder if they also, if it's the same, but it's, it's a different species, Ryan, you think, or it's the one that you well, have or one of the ones. The one, BC does have a long history of having these, um, Agriotes, uh, okay. um, ones. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to shout out to whoever named these species. I love the names. They're fantastic. <laughs> um, so if someone can introduce me to whoever named them, that would be great. Um, Kara asked, does Southern Alberta, doesn't the Southern Alberta wind just shoo the wire rooms away, Shad? Unfortunately, I mean... no. I, no, uh, I wish they would. <laughs> but to add to that is if you can go back to the University of Saskatchewan and look at some records from the 20s, and they were actually uh, researching and actually tracking them then and identifying back, you know, mm. this is this is a pest that's been on the you know throughout probably the prairies for hundreds of years i mean it it loves that no disturbance uh or low disturbance altogether and it's been around it's just in you know in the last 15 years we've we've lost some products that we've really seen some um populations start to build fast and, and if you look at the the farming practices as well is that we've gone to that intensive no-till so it comes back to that no disturbance low disturbance um so we've kind of created that environment to 
to have that perfect spot for that particular insect to thrive in now. Mm -hmm. All right. So that does bring us, I want to, I want to throw to the clip with Haley Catton to, to sort of fill in some of that background. And then I want to delve into some of the management because I think we've identified some of the key reasons why we need a really good plan for this pest. So Jay, if you can go to clip one with uh, Haley Catton at AAFC. So if you're doing scouting, um, once your crop is in the ground, so post-emergent scouting, then you're going to be looking for thinned areas um, of your field. So maybe areas where the um, seedlings never came up in the first place, or they did come up and they're starting to yellow at the center of the plant. If you see that, there could be a couple of different reasons, um, you know, um, why your crop is thinned in that area, like, for example, a frost patch. So if you want to know if it's wireworms, you have to go to that patch, go to those sick looking plants uh, and dig them up and see if you find the wireworms in the act of eating your plant's roots. So um, what, sort, what sorts of damage can they actually do long term? If they're eating the roots, you know, that could really have a yield impact. Yeah. Well, early in the season, their feeding is the most impactful on the crop, right? Because they're actually killing young plants. So they're preventing your crop from emerging from the ground. So that definitely has yield impacts and other agronomic impacts, such as opening space up for weeds to grow. So and the wireworms do continue feeding as the plants grow, but once the plants are big enough, they can withstand the feeding, right? But it's when they're at the seed and seedling stage where they're very vulnerable to just getting outright killed from wireworm feeding. And what do the wireworms actually look like if you're looking to see them in the field? Right. Um, they are... They're not actually worms. They're the larval stage of a beetle called the click beetle. There's multiple species of them, but in general, you're looking for uh, a long bodied, yellow, kind of hard shelled worm like creature. <laughs> and uh, we have some really nice photos of them. Uh, there are other things out there that people mistake for wireworms. Sometimes people mistake a cutworm for a wireworm, or uh, some beneficial insects can look like wireworms. So it is important to know. Um, what you're looking for. And speaking of beneficial insects, are there any beneficials that attack the wire? Yeah, that is very difficult to study. We think there are. You know, we just got a report from agronomist, an agronomist in Saskatchewan this past week saying they were digging around looking for wireworms, found them, but also found this other little insect that we think is the larval stage of a beneficial ground beetle that were there feeding on the wireworms underground. So, we, we think there are beneficials that eat them, but it's very difficult to know because the soil is just so hard to see through, you know? Imagine if we could see through the soil. Um, I'm sure Haley's working on that. Okay, so a key point there, of course, these are not actually worms. They are worm-like creatures, um, which is a key point in actually identifying these little things. Um, Alan says, hello. Hello, Alan. And um, so that's that's a key part. But as we mentioned, a super long life cycle. And so you can have some that, of course, just hatched. You can have some that are in their fourth or fifth year. So let's let's talk about sort of that longer term management and ryan maybe i'll start with you and i'm pretty sure it's going to come up but i'll bring it up anyway because i think it's super cool i want to talk a bit about biofumigants about some of the things you can do but let's talk even rotation so you're of course in a very uh heavy potato growing area how are farmers trying to tackle wireworm management through rotation so if you want to bring up my first uh, slide there, um, Jason, is the wire runs we have here definitely are, as I said, we're looking at four to five years. And there's been a lot of work done here, even just trying to look at the actual like life cycle of our uh, of our wire worms here, our click beetles. We have uh, province-wide surveys every three years. Um, and we've been uh, through th uh, three different cluster projects now uh, through Ag Canada. There's been a lot of work uh, uh, going on. A bunch of these slides are lent to me by uh, Dr. Nerona at AAFC, and uh, she's been doing a tremendous amount of work on this. But in PEI, where you know most of our potatoes are on a three-year rotation, and historically that rotation was potatoes followed by small grains underseeded with forages. And two of the three years of those are perfect for uh, 
uh, laying uh, eggs for Click Beetles laying eggs. And one of them is uh, an all you can eat buffet for wireworm. So um, I think that's why in PEI, we went from a little bit of wireworm in a couple different places in the early 2000s to like by about 10 years ago, like an explosion of wireworm, right? And, and it just like we had uh, populations that the world had never seen, you know, it was just bonkers levels of uh, click beetles and wireworm. And so there's been a lot of work done here in PEI to try and figure out how to both track wireworm, uh, identify where they're bad and what we can do. And then, you know, uh, chemical control, cultural control. So uh, my next slide there, um, Jason, this was a... Uh, a, a, a trap that was developed by Dr. Narona here in PEI. So a lot of people would be familiar with pheromone traps, um, which are just pitfall traps with pheromones. And I think uh, maybe uh, Shad has a picture of those in his slides as well. Those are really good at attracting the males. These knelt traps, which are super easy, it's just a light in a cup basically, and and a little uh, and that's a little fence to keep out the bigger critters than than click beetles. But it's basically the light attracts the beetles to the cup, and then there's a little solution in the cup, and it kills them. So uh, it's good for yeah. tracking the. It's good for tracking the. You know, if you've got what level of click beetles you have. But like some of the organic growers and some of the carrot growers and stuff have actually started using this for like a mass trapping. Uh, as well, like putting them around the field margins, maybe even putting a, like a little strip down the middle of the field where they put these sort of traps. So that is an option as well. Um, okay, uh, hang on, Ryan. Go... Sorry, yeah. I just, is that a red solo cup in there? Oh yeah, definitely. It, I, yeah. I knew it. I just, yeah, we gotta keep, I knew we gotta it. keep cross down here, Lindsay, yeah. Um, <laughs> the rest of it is like 3D printed and then a red solo cup, it's great. Yeah, so, okay, I love uh, it. And, and a light from Canadian Tire. So <laughs> um, my fourth slide, Jason, I've got just, I talk a little bit about mustard. So um, this again, Christine did this work and she was just, just looking at the damage and you can see like, this is holes per tuber. Um, and all three treatments where we use mustard, it more than have the, uh, the, tr the, the damage. And this was in like a really high wireworm field. But what was interesting is that basically no matter how the mustard was managed or grown, we still got, um, you know, statistically similar levels of damage. And what we've seen actually in a lot of trials over the last number of years is you don't need to do a full biofumigation with mustard to get control of, of the kind of wireworm that we have here. Just having the roots in the ground uh, does seem to have an effect. And it's uh, not just mustard, but buckwheat. Um, and actually, the, our, our wireworm here seem to be attracted to the buckwheat. So the work that they've done here at AFC is they actually want to go and feed on the buckwheat. They feed on the buckwheat roots. There's a chemical compound in the roots that then causes that affects their molting cycle. Mm. And then a whole bunch of them die. So both mustard and buckwheat are being used um, as sort of beneficial cover crops uh, ahead of potatoes. So I like soba noodles, so now I'm slightly concerned. But at least it's not made from the roots, so it's fine. I'm going to be okay. All right, okay, but Dennis, this brings up, I, I have to ask then, are, are in Ontario, are you seeing interest maybe in using the mustard biofumigant or apparently buckwheat, these sorts of things? Or how, how do vegetable growers deal with these? Yeah, I think absolutely. It's kind of interesting. I think growers have been adopting it not necessarily for the wireworm control but they're using some eastern research and using it for you know more of our soilborne disease issues scab and early dye and things like that and then seeing the benefit in the wireworm control definitely so i've heard that from growers for sure maybe you know incorporating that those green manures and the different species for other reasons and then you know almost as a secondary benefit getting the wireworm control as well um so yeah definitely um it's catching on here uh, I would say not so much the trapping, um, you know, back when we first introduced legislation that you needed um, to actually get the threshold and and mm -hmm. the bait balls and scouting and things like that. There was a little bit, but I think groves have moved away from that um, recently. So there's less trapping, but definitely the the mustard and the, the buckwheat even a little bit is catching on for sure. And Lindsay, I do have a, yeah, go ahead. A, a, I was just going to say, I do have a, there's one, I had one last slide, uh, which is the fifth one I had there, Jason, which is um, 
it kind of goes towards what uh, Dennis was just saying, which is like, this is a trial that I did a couple of years ago. And you can see like we had a couple of different rotations and not only did the wireworm damage decrease on all those rotations that included the alternate crops, like the buckwheat or the mustard, with the muck, buckwheat and the mustard, we also got a yield improvement. And uh, particularly with the ones that had mustard in it, we got, and those, this, in this case, it was, it was potatoes followed by two years of these other crops. And when we had the mustard, it was actually a biofumigant. Like it was actually put in the ground as a biofumigant. And you can see that we did get, you know, some significant yield bumps. And that's because, as Dennis said, not just are we controlling wireworm, but we're controlling verticillium and nematodes and scab and some of the other things. Um, I'm ridiculous. So I just envision like a yellow, like yellow mustard and just like in a sprayer and you just like dribble it on. And everyone with hot dogs comes running and are like, share. <laughs> anyway, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, but a uh, question for Dennis and and for Ryan from Gord Speck Snyder. I got it right. Would a bit of buckwheat in a cover crop mix be enough or do you need a solid stand? So it's a good question. Is a little little okay? Do you have to have it all? So there's some work that's being done right now at AAFC in Charlottetown where they're at, trying to answer that very question. So they're trying, they did started with lab work where they had different species in pots, trying to kind of figure out how much buckwheat in a stand, cover crop stand would deter the wireworm. And the lab studies seem to show that as little as 20% to 25% buckwheat in a cover crop mix would still significantly kill a lot of wireworm. So I think it's going to the field trials stage this year. Um, but we ha definitely have seen some anecdotal evidence where just a bit of buckwheat um, helps rather than having necessarily have the whole stand. Okay. Very cool. All right. Now, Shad, so we deal more, of course, in the cereal crops out west with wireworm. Is rotation effective enough? Is it, I mean, is it a seed treatment option? Where, where does the management plan sort of shake out uh, in the west? Well, interesting to, to hear about the mustard because, uh, you know, you, you don't have to go too far in Saskatchewan where a lot of mustard is produced. So maybe this is a viable option. Maybe, Ryan, you're doing some good work for Western Canada here on this as well. <laughs> but uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, really, it comes back to uh, in some areas, you know, you have issues with wireworms. So it, it comes down to, you know, I know I have a problem. I need to protect my investment of the genetics in there. So I'm going to protect that with a insecticide seed treatment that's option one you can stretch that out to maybe longer rotations uh the cover crop idea is becoming a lot more of a reality in today's farming practices with some producers so that i think that adding that diversity in there is going to help control on that um what for all intents and purposes it's really about going out and scouting and being proactive even the year before and uh mm -hmm. producer jason if you just bring up the the click beetle trap and Ryan, I, I love the female one on that. That's uh, it's pretty neat because it's so simple. It is it's such a simple way to determine. And I did see in the, the question uh, with Kara about bait balls versus non-bait balls. Uh, I myself personally have gone away from the bait balls because we've be, everyone doesn't have enough time in their lives. Uh, the bait ball is a kind of a, a consuming project to put out in the fields. You got to time it right when the when the wire room is going to be active as well. There's a lot of different environmental conditions that may take place and you may never get a true result. You, you will get some, you may not get some. It's there's, there's, I guess, an inconsistency to it. And granted, if you don't put a flag with that bait ball, you may be hard pressed to ever find that bait ball again. So just word of caution on that. However, with the click beetle traps, if you know you're growing a cereal crop in a certain field the, the year prior, um, this is a very easy investment to go ahead and do. And this one, Ryan caught on very quickly on this as well, is that this one was from so, some of the sites I had last year in Southern Alberta, where we're, we were trialing a pheromone and man, does this work, man. It draws into the adult wire, uh, wire with the click beetle uh, quite extensively, but it's a simple, it's a simple time saver. At first we started off when we started doing this program, uh, you were putting these click beetle traps in the ground level, like you saw there uh, at four corners of 160 acres. Uh, and all what I've what I've scaled that back down to is that one at an approach and you're finding the same results. But this gives you it won't it won't quantify how many wireworms you have in the field, but it will tell you the species 
and it will tell you that you have something so you can start to manage and get your game plan ready for that following cereal, cereal year if you're planting that cereal crop in there. Okay, so hang on a second because Kara asked the question, but we're going to talk about bait balls in a second. Um, and we're going to go to a clip with John Kowalski first. But Shad, does the species matter significantly on my decision as to whether or not I'm going into cereal, whether or not I'm choosing a seed treatment? If I can actually tell, so are they there or not? And what species, is there a difference? Yeah, definitely. There's the, something like Destructor is probably the, uh, the one that's going to do the most damage. It's also the biggest of the wildworm species out there uh, compared to the other two species in there. So yeah, definitely knowing that if you've got a lot of Destructors in that particular field, then uh, maybe it's an insecticide seed treatment as well as, you know, I'm going to lose some plant stand to this as well. So I'm going to have to maybe bump my seeding rates up as well. So it does allow mm -hmm. to take some risk out of the management side to do your planning with it. Okay. Now, um, before we go to the clip, uh, Jay, I do want to just quickly, so we've talked about mustard. And so I have I have my answer in my head, but Kara um, did ask, she said, okay, so canola and mustard, very closely related. Tons of that in rotation in the West. Why doesn't it have the same impact? My guess is the glucosinolate component. Um, am I right? What do I win? Ryan's <laughs> nodding. Yeah, no, the and we found especially the brown mustards and uh, they have the highest glucosinolate level in the roots. So that's okay. where it's yep. where the real impact is. If the if the glucosinolate levels are high in the roots, that's what is deterring and slowing down and actually killing the wireworm. So what do we know what it is in buckwheat that kills them? Yeah, I don't know exactly what chemical it is, but it's not a of course it's not a glucosinolate. It's a different. Uh, chemical which i think is related yeah. to also how buckwheat um can be somewhat alleliopathic as well against like certain yeah. weeds and things like that but anyway the afc team here has been doing a pile of work including like chemistry work to sort of try and figure that out and uh, yeah. i think there's going to be a bunch of papers published on that here in the next little while very cool and ray Dobanko says i get a hat for guessing glucosinolates correctly so i'll add that to my collection thanks ray it's like a gift to myself from myself okay uh very quickly i want to come back to this bait ball thing because i think scouting of course is one of these key things i've got a couple questions to follow up with on that as well so jay if you can queue up this is uh kara oosterhouse again she did a lot of wireworm videos i gotta tell you guys uh with john kovlowski talking about bait balls uh if people want to try to assess levels and um, make a decision for themselves. You can put what we call bait balls into the field. You can soak some corn or wheat or oatmeal, uh, make a bit of a ball out of it and bury it into the soil. Use a flag or something to mark the area. Let it sit for a week or so and dig things up. If you're finding any more than one or two per bait ball, uh, you probably do have a, a population that could be damaging to your crop if you're uh, having trouble finding them doing that the decent chance you you don't have a problem however that being said um, bait balls can really vary in how effective they're going to be the uh, wireworms are using carbon dioxide to find food basically so uh, your your seeds the roots they give off carbon dioxide and those carbon dioxide trails are what the wireworms follow to get to the plants. So if you've put a bait ball in a field that has a lot of green vegetation in it as a competing CO2 source, uh, that will affect how successful the bait balls are going to be. Okay, so what are some techniques that producers can actually use besides um, bait balls and insecticide? Can you spray for wireworms? You cannot do a foliar spray for wireworms. There's nothing registered it would be, uh, I'll say useless, really. Uh, you, you won't get the insecticide down to where the wireworms are, no matter what you put on. So there aren't foliar sprays currently available. It's just insecticides, uh, seed treatments, rather, for insecticides. Now, aside from the seed treatments, um, anything you can do to get quick germination and early growth, pretty much the same story we have for flea beetles, anything that gives you quick 
early growth will really help. So seeding into warm ground is good. Um, seeding at an appropriate depth, not too deep, might be helpful. Uh, packing the soil a bit might be helpful. So any anything to get that quick early growth will help you get through the more vulnerable period for wire worms. Um, where we often run into problems if people are seeding into cooler soil and the seed sits there a long time or that early growth is taking a long time, that can uh, increase your risk of the wire worms doing economic damage. Oh my goodness, I miss John Glavosky. Okay, so some some good points there, of course. Um, Shad, you didn't mention, but I have heard of skunks also loving bait balls. So very quickly, bait balls, yay or nay, rapid fire, Shad, yes or no, do I bother? Uh, no. Okay, Dennis? Oh No. Okay, Ryan? Try carrots instead. <gasps> what? We, I don't have PDI, to make an onion bag and like mash a boat no, meal. Just put carrots. No, uh, re real quickly, what we've, what we've de de well, again, what Ag Canada developed here is, again, super simple. Get a piece of really big bore uh, tailpipe put it on the end of a metal rod, make a hole in the ground, dump some chopped up carrots, like really smashed up carrots in it, put it down, put the soil back on top, put a flag, come back in a week with the same tool and go back down where you were. And it takes out the soil and the carrots at the same time and then throw it in a bag. And then you can go through the carrots and look for a wire worm. And you don't have to make any any balls and you, it's a lot more like in and out. So it's an easier yeah. system. Okay. Uh, the, the other the other useful tool and I would say and this is this is kind of a my prop here uh Ooh, if you haven't got it like prop. uh I like it. yeah this is this is hey Dr Haley Catton's work that she's done along with across the prairies and it's a really really good in-depth uh look of the wire room uh the other uh and producer Jay if you can throw up the the one map that talks about just all species that I had, it would have been the, one of the first ones. I think this is a really good tool. All the different work that the surveys have been put in over years with uh, Agriculture Canada uh, and partially with Syngenta as well, is that you can really actually see from here, okay, where 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 we're finding wireworms. And ultimately they're across the prairies now. You've got your your pockets that are hot spots uh, that growers have been combating with for uh, quite some time. but. For all intents and purposes, this is this is another resource too to look at some of the survey data that's come off in the past ten years as well. That is, I do love maps. Now, okay, Shad, you did mention, and so I want to come back back to this a bit because John Gavlowski mentions it as well that you know part of the management of this is getting that crop off to the best start possible, getting it up out of the ground, actively growing. So. Unlike, so I, I think about something like flea beetles that, you know, they're eating cotyledons that's incredibly hard on the plant. But similarly, wireworm, especially with cereals, they're eating the roots, they're eating, you know, on seedlings on very small plants. So how important is it to sort of plan for it and get that crop out and out of the ground quickly? Yeah, so that comes back to a management tool in your operation where you want to be. And like I said before, we've, we've got some uh, planting starting to happen in southern Alberta. It's er it's earlier, but it's taken advantage of that moisture. Uh, it's The soil temperature is, is maybe a bit cooler. So that's why you want to invest into, uh, I would invest into a seed treatment. And that's where you're going to get your protection, not only from the wireworm, but also you got to realize soil borne disease too. So letting that plant put its energy into growing, get out of the ground versus trying to combat uh, diseases and things like that to give it the best possible start. Uh, so John's absolutely right, absolutely right that the, the the less you can have that that actual cedar plant sitting in the ground and not growing, the better off you are. So those tools, those type of things going forward are gonna allow you and that plant to get that stand establishment. But if you're having those wire worms and you're not gonna have to comb combat that, another side and it's all comes to the cost too is like part of it too is that you can put more seed into the ground and say i'm going to take um x amount of plants are gonna i'm gonna lose on that so i'm gonna up my seeding rate as well with that to compensate for the plants that i'm going to use from stand establishment mm -hmm. now dennis you're working with 
um, you know, some root vegetables, some pretty high value crops, but usually also I'm going to assume more tillage, which um, they still seem to do just fine with. As Pete points out, potato ground gets tilled just a, a lot and wireworm doesn't tend to like it, but seems to be doing fine. So, so how do you approach it from, you know, where you've got a high value crop where appearance, just like with potatoes and other crops is super important. What does the management, what does integrated management look like for these vegetable crops? Yeah, it's interesting. I saw Peter mention that um, I've heard of growers using that first pass tillage as sort of a threshold, you know, because you can see a lot of times the soil warms up a little bit. You can see the wire worms on top, um, take a handful and you can kind of tell just from that, uh, that first kind of tillage pass for sure what your levels are. Um, but I think here we have, because it's sort of a, a patchy, we have uh, relied a lot on crop history. Uh, a lot of our vegetable rotations do have susceptible, um, you know, crops in that rotation. So a lot of times you can follow along the damage and know even, you know, areas of the field sometimes where your high spots are. So we have relied a lot on that. We have, um, you know, relied on chemical means uh, quite a bit. Um, a catch-22 with the wireworm products is it has to be fairly toxic to kill wireworms and when you have a fairly toxic pro product you know sometimes you kill things that you don't want to which you know mm -hmm. your environmental uh regulation we seem to be um getting a wireworm product and losing it fairly quickly um so historically we've had a little bit of you know group 1b organophosphate carbamate use um historically um but um yeah, it seems to be uh, almost a, um, a hamster wheel sometimes when we're looking for different chemicals. We seem to lose them. We had we liked capture for a little bit. Seemed to work very well, repelling, um, you know, repelling the wire worms away from where we're growing that marketable um, crop. Um, but again, lost that one as well. So we are definitely moving away from chemical means to, you know, introducing better cover crops in the rotation, maybe taking land out of production for a year, focusing mm -hmm. on green manure cover cropping, uh, just so, you know, quality for these high value, value crops is worth it. You know, it, sometimes it's not worth it to try and make a little bit of money on, you know, another crop, a field crop. It, sometimes it's worth it to just focus on rehabbing that soil controlling something like wireworm and getting that quality boost in the end on your high value crops. We're definitely seeing that here. Mm -hmm. So, and that sort of, that Peter is um, perhaps somewhat reading my mind, which is perhaps also frightening. Uh, but as if you, if I use brown mustard or buckwheat, so, and Dennis, along these lines of exactly that, of, of, you know, choosing, let's say you've got a piece of ground, right? You take it out of production because you're planning for the next year, which maybe Ryan after you can count on, on this comment as well, but how often do we have to have it in rotation? So, so thinking about it from the veg uh, production, I mean, is that a one in three years? Is that a one in six years, a one in five? What might that look like? Yeah. So we have some very innovative growers, I, I guess, short answer. We don't really know yet. We have some really innovative growers that have, you know, tried that are doing just potato rehab cover cropping mix back to potato um and they are having um you know great success with that so um you know is that long term i guess we'll see we are doing a lot of the uh, some of the work now to try and figure out exactly what's going on and what's helping in the long term but um yeah i think generally we have tight rotations and the growers that are incorporating cover shops are still doing a tight rotation and mm -hmm. they at least anecdotally are definitely happy with what they're seeing they're, they see they say that they're seeing a yield bump they say that they're seeing quality improvements so you know i believe them for sure okay ryan what does it look like in pei so i think the quick answer is there's no one solution for everybody and it, it's very much dependent on again crop history uh where you're at uh what's your target crop um, we found here, it's really, it has to be an IPM approach. So we have to kind of scout to know what is your level of wireworm, what's the potential level of damage. We're we talking about massive levels, little bit here and there. And then that's going to help make the decision. Do I, do I need to do anything? Is it 
threshold? Is it not? Um, do I grow, uh, am I growing table stock potatoes or processing where I can maybe get, take a little bit of wireworm damage and it's not worth the insecticide? Or do I have a like monumental amount of wireworm and I'm growing table stock potatoes, so I need to do something and I may need to do wireworm or buckwheat back to back years or double crop in a year to really start bringing the numbers down. Um, it, there's a lot that goes into those. I, I would say those decisions. I mean, the, uh, a bit of a change here in PEI is for a long time, we didn't have many chemicals that worked or that worked very effectively on our wireworms. So as I said before, the neonics didn't really work. Um, some of the other chemicals didn't really work that did work in other places. Thymus was about the only option we had for a lot of time. And we're going to talk about like, you know, a blunt instrument for, you know, it, it, for killing uh, soilborne insects is thymid, and it's really nasty and really dirty to use. Um, but it was the only tool we had. Then we had capture for a while, but it only stunned them. Now, last year was the first year with uh, Cymegra, which is the new product from BASF. Um, and it seems to be working, um, and it it's registered on potatoes and corn, and they have another version, which is available on grains. So, but um, it's very expensive. So, like, it is it works really well on our wireworm but people in other parts of the country have wireworm where neonics and other treatments still work so if they still work use them you know but it's important to know again what wireworms do you have uh where are you at use the surveys like as shad said ag canada has been doing surveys all over canada and pretty much every province mm -hmm. on wireworm so uh there is you know good data out there to kind of figure out what you need to do so Shad, I want to go to you because we've also got a question about seed treatments. And I mean, that is your jam, the seed care side. So I want to go to you in just a moment. But Ryan, I have one question um, that I thought of earlier. It, you showed that graphic where you showed what sort of early feeding looks like. And then, of course, that damage that it does to the tubers, which is, of course, the, the costliest of the damage when we're talking about potatoes. Do, are you scouting for that damage early on? And is that indicative of what fall pressure might be? Or are they not necessarily related? So in potatoes, our seed pieces are like two and a half ounces. <laughs> so a, uh, a, a you, wireworm aren't really taken down a two and a half ounce seed piece. So you don't usually see emergence issues with wireworm and potatoes. What we do okay. see is, uh, it, you know, if you have a fields around it that you have corn or grain or something, and you see emergence issues, that's more, you, that can be indicative. What potato growers here are doing is they're either doing pheromone traps the spring before, like the, the year before they're going to have potatoes that use those pheromone traps in the spring, or they would be doing um, uh, so like the baiting in the fall before, like in September and trying to kind of assess what the, what the levels are. And then that makes the decision for the next year of, is this a field I need to leave out another year? Is this a field I need to, you know, use an insecticide on that sort of stuff. Okay. All right, Shad, the floor is yours. Jason vote wants to know, how do we rank the different seed treatments? So I'm, I'm I'll, gonna... just let, <laughs> I'll just let everybody know. He's seed care guy for Syngenta. So obviously, but but put it another way, how do we evaluate what's available on the market uh, for the conditions that you're in? Well, we're going to have to ha uh, hop in the time machine here and go into the past. I'm going to speak to the past before I can speak to the future because I think it'll all tie in. And before my time, uh, there was there was a product in the marketplace that you know to Ryan's point you know it solved all problems that was it used it was a one in four years you used it um, everything was good the problem was that you know um, in this industry we're all environmentalists whether we like it or not and we have to protect the land that we grow with so this was deemed by uh, you know the World Health Organization as a pollutant so they had to take that off the marketplace and new technologies came in that were a lot more holistic into the sense that it was a management tool that you can use to get that seal crop established. You can get that stand that you were desired to stand establish. And I'm a firm believer in stand establishment because a firm stand is going to lead to your overall yield. It's like the, the pyramids in Egypt. They've been there for thousands and thousands of years. What's the one consistent thing is a strong base. And you can think about your yield being on top, that's what you're gunning for because there's a lot of other things that after that crop gets out of the ground that it has to deal with. So having that strong uh, seed treatment protection from that standpoint is 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 key uh, and it's the fungicide package and it's also about the in, in the insecticide package. With that, 
in the marketplace today, you have one, you've got treatments that are systemic that protects against the wire worm feeding on the plant itself. And you have products that are contact, which protects the seed and will, uh, there's a mortality on that if it eats from the seed. Um, the pros and cons is that uh, the one that is systemic stops the feeding, gets your stand establishment, it grows with the plant. Uh, the other product is only contact, doesn't grow with the plant. So if you don't have any feeding on that seed itself, you're not getting the benefits of the insecticide from that. Uh, whereas the systemic properties, you've got that plant kind of covered off to stop that feeding right away. You may lose some plants due to some feeding of the wireworms. It's, and to Haley Catton's point as well, you open that plant for some infection too, because now mm -hmm. if it's being bored out, you have soil borne disease that could move out. You've got stress on that plant as well. So to me, um, a combination of different things, looking at your, your actual crop history is a big part of it. If you've got fields that have been mowed out uh, by wireworms attacks, maybe that's something that you're going to have to look at. You may need to switch the time of seeding. So if it comes back, there's really, you can't rank anything. There's lots of pros and cons to all these the different treatments themselves. But for all intents and purposes, I think there's a lot of different management tools you as a grower can sit down and start to look at to make the best decision possible for your operation. Well, and in thinking back to, so Pete, of course, puts in the good word for ultra early seeding. Um, in that, so wireworm, of course, is in the soil, it moves up and then it goes back down, right? Because it only likes soil that's a certain temperature. So it doesn't want to get hot up near the surface, uh, but it also will only come up when it's warm. So there is that window of time, right? That that we have to be more concerned about those wireworms feeding. So I'm just going to correct you, Lindsay. They, they, the, the biggest thing about this, they love cool, cool, moist soil. But not hot, that is, right? Like not, once it's not, yeah, not hot. Once, and, yeah. That, and, and primary, what we've seen over the past few years in different spots in Western Canada due to not enough early season moisture is that we've seen wireworms actually come and feed late. If we've had a weather event and you've got that subsoil moisture meeting up with the moisture on top now, all of a sudden you'll, yeah. you'll see a rush of feeding. So I contribute this, what I've seen in the past couple of years, it's like my golf game. There's a, a consistency to be inconsistent about <laughs> how the wireworm feeds. And so you may have times where it's feeding on the seed. You may see it actually feeding on the growing point and killing that plant underneath. You may see cereal crops into the leaf stage that are still being fed on by wireworms, depending on the environmental conditions as well. And I've seen, and uh, to, to Dennis's point too, in some sandier soils in Southern Alberta, uh, late June where that plant is, you know, almost <laughs> in the five leaf stage and you're still seeing wireworm effects because it was a cold spring yeah. and that sandy soil just stayed cool and moist. And we just continue in feeding on that. But you're absolutely right. As soon as it warms up um, and starts to dry out, it does not like that warmer kind of drier soil and it'll move down into this yeah. cooler soil moisture profile. Which is, again, part of why this is such a tricky pest, right? Because it's they don't come above ground. You, you're you not going to find them there. If conditions change, they're going to sort of disappear on you, which um, great because maybe it means they're not causing the damage. But if you're trying to scout or any of these sorts of things doesn't really help you. Um, Peter wants to make a note about there may still be this sounds like an old like Peter I don't know I feel like you're making stuff up here uh that there was a law in Ontario that you can't plant buckwheat before June 15th because the strong buckwheat honey will contaminate the wonderful clover honey but I would like to correct him for the record Ontario honey it's good but it's not canola honey so I'm just gonna put that out there that western <laughs> Canadian honey is far better anyway and it is very true that I still get Western Canadian friends to send me Western Canadian honey because I can't eat Ontario honey. I'm sure it's great for you, Ontario people, and I love your maple syrup, but I can't eat the honey. So we, whatever. Anyway. We, do, we do get comments here from, because uh, we have a lot of guys that have bees for the blueberries, uh, the right, wild yeah. blueberries, and yeah. uh, they don't like having <laughs> much buckwheat around, but sort of the, mm -hmm. uh, sort of the, uh, the compromise for some people is uh, the buckwheat will regrow if you mow it high, 
Uh, so, uh, so you can mow it before it really goes out into full flower, uh, and it'll keep it going a little bit longer. And then you can maybe keep your, your, uh, bee guys a little happier. Right. Cause it does make it a little dark, a little strong, yeah. I guess. Yeah. So there you go. It's like molasses. Um, anyway, I don't mind it, but please everyone in Western Canada, send me your honey. Um, all right. Okay. We are out of time just like that. That went incredibly, incredibly quickly. And uh, thank you to each of you with three guests. Uh, I think we managed okay uh, to let everybody, of course, share what they wanted to share. We got to our slides. We got to two clips. I didn't have a third one, everybody. So little little hack there. Um, if you don't have three clips, you can't miss the third one. Uh, so there you go. All right. But uh, thank you to everyone in the comments. And uh, Shad, thank you so much. Dennis, thank you. Ryan, thank you for staying up this late. I know it's incredibly <laughs> late where you are. And and we're interrupting a hockey game. So I do appreciate all it. All good. Yeah. All right. Okay. And a reminder, of course, uh, you can go and head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist for your CU credits tomorrow. And a quick reminder, we will not have a show next week, but we'll be back April 18th and it's going to be a good one. We're going to be talking about end stabilizers, uh, nitrogen efficiency products. Uh, it's going to be a pretty good one. We've got a stellar lineup. It's going to be a hot topic this year and for probably many years to come. So make sure to uh, set your reminders for that. And with that, thank you again to all of my guests tonight. Thank you to everyone in the comments. Um, this is what makes it fun and what makes it interesting. And we all learn together and I really appreciate it. Um, and I'll see you in two weeks. Cheers, everybody.